NASDAQ's ramping up this morning more than a percent. Cloud companies not getting left behind. We've got a nice little rally, but compared to the COVID high, still far removed as opposed to an Apple, Microsoft, or NVIDIA, either at fresh records or close. Let's talk about what to expect this earnings season with Greg Moskowitz joining us. Tom White getting ready to do some trading. Greg is a senior software equity research analyst at Mizuho, uh, covering companies like Salesforce and Snowflake. So, Greg, what are we looking for this earnings? Uh, how can we get that type of lift off in some of these stocks? I know it's been a good year, but they still got a lot of room to close with their COVID highs. Yeah, well, thank you, Oliver. Thanks for having me. Uh, good to be back. So uh, this earnings season is, as you indicated, it's going to be an important one, right? Uh, we are um, hoping to hear some more signs of stability. If you sort of, you know, kind of look at, at Q1 and um, sort of the, um, you know, the carryover of some of the macro issues that surfaced last year, um, there were a lot of resets on um, earnings numbers for calendar 23 slash fiscal 24. Um, uh, and as we now are, are kind of moving through this period where there's, as you indicated on a, on a recent segment, there's a lot of generative AI hype. Uh, obviously, these multiples have expanded. So expectations are higher. And now, again, we need to hear uh, not any, you know, indications of, of, of stellar execution and, and a much better uh, macro. I don't think anyone is expecting that. But again, it kind of comes back to stability. It comes back to gaining some confidence that uh, these numbers are reasonable and that companies uh, and management teams can execute uh, according to uh, uh, to plan and to the expectations that have been set. Uh, that would be a, a very good uh, uh, point on which to build as we enter into the back half of the year. Who's got the most potential here to uh, tell us that the kind of post-COVID overhang is officially over and maybe show some reacceleration of, of growth. Who's going to lead that front in the software space? Yeah, it's a little uh, too early, I think, to make the calls on reacceleration. But uh, I will say a couple of things. Uh, one area which is going to be very important to watch uh, is uh, uh, the area of consumption-based business models. And that starts with the hyperscalers, with Azure and, and AWS, and to a lesser extent, uh, Google Cloud. Last quarter, uh, Microsoft, uh, on their earnings call, made the allusion to uh, the fact that we are approaching the anniversary of uh, um, optimization uh, that that customers had been engaging with uh, with these customers. In other words, um, the macro starts to um, uh, uh, you know have a downturn, as we all know. Last year, uh, uh, organizations are not operating as as uh, as well. They're not thriving in the way that they were previously, and so they look to optimize their cloud workloads, meaning they're not spending quite as much uh, with those companies, with Azure, with AWS, et cetera. Uh, so now that we are approaching, again, a lapping or an anniversarying uh, of that uh, downturn, uh, the hope is that we will see some more signs of, again, stability as it relates to, uh, to these results. Uh, one other thing to kind of point out is, and you mentioned Salesforce, uh, we have seen uh, several companies uh, engage in, in price increases for their software products or for some, some major uh, products products within their portfolio. Salesforce, the most recent example, uh, of course, uh, just this week, uh, raised their pricing by 9% uh, across their major clouds, including sales cloud and service cloud. And so that will obviously have a positive effect as we move forward as well. Right now, is uh, there a uh, potential surprise on the uh, demand side? Or is the outlook pretty clear? I mean, there was so much volatility around COVID. It seems like what you're describing is kind of a stabilization, almost like a, like a comps. Like, you know, we're kind of moving out of like a volatile period for comps in a way. Yes, I think that's uh, I, I think that's very fair to say. Uh, we've been sort of cycling through this period where the comps were were very difficult, and then for a lot of these software companies, there there clearly was a, a benefit, a pull forward of spending, an acceleration of spending uh, for a period of time, kind of post uh, the onset of COVID. Uh, we now clearly have you know exited that period, and then also as we head into the second half of this calendar year, Oliver, uh, many of these companies, not all of them, but many of these companies are going to start to experience much more favorable comps, uh, given that, again, uh, we started to see some of the ill effects from the macro uh, last year, and especially in the, 
the back half of the year. So as we get into uh, calendar Q3, calendar Q4, uh, these compares will look quite a bit easier. Uh, and hopefully, again, with some more indications that demand is, uh, is at least stabilizing, uh, that can uh, uh, provide a, a nice little tailwind to some of these business models, certainly, as we head into that, again, that back half of the year. Stabilization of demand equate to stabilization of workforce? No more big cuts ahead? We hope so. Uh you know, nobody likes to see the, um, uh, the, the you know, scope of workforce reductions that have taken place across uh, the U.S. and just the broader, um, uh, uh, the broader world, the global economy. Uh, it has been a significant reset uh, that obviously has caused a lot of uh, tough times for, um, for a lot of folks and a lot of uh, organizations that have had to retrench. Um, uh, but yes, the hope is that uh, uh, with things firming up and with a lot of these cuts having been uh, made, that, that companies can start to be a little bit more forward thinking, uh, start to really, um, uh, you know, kind of map out uh, uh, broader growth strategies, uh, start to make sure they have the resourcing in place to fulfill uh, these strategies. And, and, and part of this is also generative AI. A lot of companies we think we're going to see uh, uh, really move forward in terms of innovating and making sure that uh, that they can leverage uh, this exciting, uh, exciting technology. All of this requires investment. Uh, and so, uh, so again, the hope is that uh, the worst is, is, is very much behind us in terms of those reductions and that uh, we start to get to, again, that point of stabilization and then hopefully uh, uh, fairly soon after growth in, in, in you know, workforces at large as we, uh, as we move forward. All right. Uh, great stuff, uh, Greg. Thanks for the preview here for us. A good uh, framework for us to use going into this earnings season and do some trading here. Greg Moskowitz joining us from Azuho. I got Tom here ready to trade. Salesforce first. Let's go yeah. there. Probably one of the best looking charts of the group right now. Yeah, up over 70% this year. And uh, they just raised their prices 9% across the board on some of their cloud offer offerings. Also, that's supposed to kind of lift revenue moving forward. Their last earnings event was a blowout, uh, beat expectations. Guidance was a hiked. Uh, on that one, they've been uh, really forthright with uh, mm. a lot of their cuts as far as employees. Good reminder at, on guidance, that was big. Yep, yeah, it was big. Uh, 823, uh, August 23rd is their earnings date. So I kind of looked at a strategy that's short term that avoids that because maybe there's going to be a disappointment, but it still takes advantage of a grind higher. So I looked at a call calendar to the upside here using the 240 strike where I'm going to go out to the August monthly uh, series that expires in 36 days. Uh, August 18th, buy the 240 call, sell, sell that same strike in the July 21st monthly options that expire uh, in eight days here, sell that same 240 call. You're paying roughly about a $290, $3 debit for that. That's going to be your risk on it, uh, what you pay on this type of spread. So it's low cost entry point, low risk, it's risk defined. But you can see here from the risk profile that, yeah, while you're targeting the 240 strike, you want it to grind up there over the next month. Look at that range that you still have where you're going to be profitable between just below 230 on the downside and just above 253 on the upside. So this takes advantage of a grind higher, but it also takes advantage of a nice wide range that you're trading in. Now, if implied volatility increases, that's also going to expand the price of this calendar. You have that ability to roll that short option that expires in eight days week to week, and then you'll collect credits. That'll increase potential profitability and also reduce your risk every time you do collect credits. But definitely a bullish strategy, but just slightly with giving yourself that range in case the stock just trades uh, within those two uh, break-even points. All right, like it. So mm -hmm. avoiding the earnings in case they don't go as well right. as last time. Right. Still gives you plenty of time though, because we've got earnings pretty far out from here. So yeah. almost a two month trade. Okay, how about for Snowflake, if we kind of go down the performance spectrum a little bit, it's been all right, but it hasn't been great by any means. No, not compared to a lot of the other cloud-based companies uh, in this uh, space. Uh, it's only up, what, 23, 24% so far this year. So it's underperformed Pennies. a little bit. Yeah. Pennies I, in 2023. <laughs> it is compared to the NASDAQ as a whole, right? Um, but uh, it's had made some inroads. You see there uh, on the far right of this chart, it's made some inroads here. Now, they have earnings on the 23rd of August also, same day that CRM reports. 
So I looked at a strategy that avoids earnings once again, but still is a basically a neutral to bullish type strategy. So I'm taking advantage. Snowflake's got some higher implied volatility than a lot of other tech names at this point. So I looked at a cash secured put where um, it's still bullish, but it's also neutral because I'm giving myself a cushion to the downside going out to that same August 18th monthly cycle, so 36 days till expiration, and just selling a slightly out of the money put. In this case, I used a 170 strike put um, that's currently below the share, uh, current share price. You're collecting a credit of about 680 on that. So what does this mean, right? Well, I profit in three out of four scenarios on this type of strategy, right? Stock goes higher. I keep that credit that I, collect six, uh, that I collected, $680 per contract that you sell. Uh, also, if the stock stays right here, you keep, get to keep that credit. But then also, if it goes below, uh, remains below or above 170, sorry about that, above 170, you get to keep that credit. Now, if it does fall below 170 into expiration and you get a sign on that, you're buying the shares at a discount of 163.20 to the downside. That's an 8% cushion to where it's currently trading. So you can either want you either want to keep the credit that you collect on this type of strategy or you're willing to buy the shares at a lower price entry point if you if you hold uh, that short put through expiration and it's below 170 so cash secured put taking advantage of that higher implied volatility All right a little bit of a different approach for a very different chart yeah this is kind of why the cloud sector uh, has been a little bit lagging the big AI trade. It's a little bit more mixed, right. but if a company like Salesforce could keep it up through this earnings and repeat what they did last time, it uh, could be joining into the party. Thanks, Tom, for mm -hmm. the trades. All right.